I was trained as a physician, I studied medicine, um, but when I did my PhD in epidemiology, um, I was on the side of saying that the determinants of health in the population are not health care, but the social determinants of health. So in a way, it's not that I was in opposition to the UHC or primary health care, but it wasn't my focus. Uh, and um, Amarata, it's very interesting. If you didn't read the Amarata Declaration, you'd say it was all about primary health care. And I remember Canadian, who was a member of my global commission, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, Monique Bajan, former Minister of Health of Canada. And she said, well, when the Amarata Declaration on Primary Health Care came out, they said in, Cam in Canada, well, that's got nothing to do with us. Uh, we're all tertiary care. But if you actually read, and as I did when we started the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, reread the Amarata Declaration, in fact, about half of it is about social determinants of health. <clears throat> it's not just about health care. And Mirta Roses, who was a former director of the Pan American Health Organization, the American region of WHO, she said social determinants of health and primary health care are sisters. Uh, they need each other. I was concerned at, at one point, WHO wanted to roll social determinants of health into primary health care and make it part of it. And I thought, no, that's not a good thing to do. That um, it would mean that social determinants of health disappeared. And that's not a good thing to do because they're different. One really is about practitioners um, delivering health care to the population. And the other is about action on the determinants of health in the population. You pointed out in your hi little highlight that I became president of the World Medical Association for a year. <clears throat> and in fact, preceding that, I was president of the British Medical Association for a year. And I thought when they asked me, um, I, I'd be president of the BMA is an honor place. That's the chair of council. And when they asked me to do it, and I said, I've spent my life emphasizing the social determinants of health, not health care. You really think I'm the right person for this post? And they said, yes. So I said, okay. Let's try and get people working in primary health care to engage with the social determinants of health. So this is a long way round to your question, because you, you asked me about when did I realize it was important. To say three things. The first is the opening line of my book, The Health Gap, which I took from our thinking about the commission was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. So we need to deal with the conditions that make people sick, the social determinants of health. The second is that we've been trying to get health care, and I did this at the BMA and I did it at the World Medical Association, trying to get health care organizations to engage with the social determinants of health. And the third is a couple of recent reports in the UK make clear that in the UK at least, the more deprived the area of residence, the greater the use of healthcare services. So it's not that poor people are missing out on healthcare, they're using the healthcare system much more. Well, of course they should, they have more illness. If you want to reduce the burden on the healthcare system, take action to reduce inequalities in health. 
So we've got in Britain where our healthcare system is struggling under the strain, it's been neglected or worse, systematically undermined by government. Um, and yes, it needs more money and more care and attention, but more action on the social determinants of health would reduce some of that excess burden on the healthcare system. So we need each other is the answer. Thank you a lot for the brilliant um, response. Are there some comments or questions from the participants? Um, uh, Michael, you know, I have been following you with passion for more than a decade now. And we have, we have been discussing in person about the way that we need to somehow integrate uh, social determinants of health and health equity within the primary health care. My question to you is, specifically after COVID-19, in countries like mine, uh, middle-income countries or low-income countries, we still struggle to have this determinants of equity embedded within the PHC. And having the fact that the new health order after the COVID-19 crisis has jeopardized the investments on the primary health care specifically for some policymakers, what are your very practical uh, recommendations for the health policymakers in order to ensure that health equity still remains the biggest uh, embedded uh, value for going ahead when they are building UHC on the top of PHC. Thank you. Well, um, firstly, very good to see you and to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, if you've been following what we did, we produced um, two reports in 2020. Well, we produced more than two, but, uh, but two significant reports in 2020. Um, the first in fe for the UK, the first was in February 2020, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on. And that was produced just before the pandemic, literally February, um, the, something like the 25th of February 2020, <clears throat> documenting what had happened in the 10 years since my English Marmot Review. But then came the pandemic. And you'll remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people said it'll be the great leveler. It will affect kings and their subjects alike, prime ministers and paupers. And my reaction to that was what rubbish. Um, we know whether it's an earthquake, um, a tsunami, a hurricane, a pandemic, a civil war. It's always the poor who are more affected by a major external shock. And the pandemic guaranteed will be no different. And indeed, in our Build Back Fair report published in December 2020, at the end of the first year of the first nine months of the pandemic, we showed that the inequalities in COVID-19 mortality was almost exactly parallel to the inequalities in all-cause mortality. In other words, that the pandemic um, was exposing the underlying inequalities in society and amplifying them. And I said at the time, and I say still, that yes, it's important to control the virus, vaccination, booster vaccination, social distancing, and the like, very important. But we need to deal with the inequalities um, as well. So COVID came along and it, as I said, exposed and amplified the underlying inequalities. And indeed, the attempts to control the virus also amplified the inequalities. So, for example, it was pointed out in the north of England, in the northwest, in Greater Manchester, where we worked, people were being asked to come forward to be tested 
if they had suspect, suspect symptoms of COVID and if they were tested to be off work. But they were not being compensated economically. So um, the evidence was people were reluctant to be tested because um, it was uh, an economic catastrophe. If you were tested and were off work, your income ceased. Initially, there was um, a furlough scheme to bail out people. But when that furlough scheme stopped, um, then uh, without making the appropriate economic arrangements, uh, in the first year in Britain, in the first year of the pandemic, economic inequalities went down because of the government intervention with the furlough scheme. But in the second year, normal service was resumed and inequalities, economic inequalities increased again. So the, uh, what the pandemic showed was it was even more vital to pay attention to equity. And the reason I called my report Build Back Fairer was because in the decade in Britain leading up to 2020, life expectancy more or less stopped improving, health inequalities increased, and life expectancy for the poorest people went down. And it seemed highly likely that that was a result of the government that was elected in 2010, pursuing policies of austerity after the global financial crisis. It was almost as if they used the global financial crisis as an excuse to roll back the state to reduce public spending. And the result was a calamity for health and health inequalities. So it's a long answer to your question, but the pandemic made it even more vital to have equity as a fundamental principle of what we do in planning healthcare, planning social services more generally, and looking at how we organize our affairs in society. Yes, uh, it's a comment and a question. First of all, uh, good to see you, Sir Michael. Um, as you know, in the times of the Commission on Social Terms of Health, I had the privilege to be a member of your Knowledge Hub on Health Systems, and we produced a contribution on the importance of primary health care as a strategy to achieve equitable care. And I still remember that it was not an easy discussion with the health systems people uh, to make the plea for strengthening primary health care as one of the strategies to achieve uh, more equity in health. But finally, I think it was taken up in the final report and we were very happy that it happened that way. That way. And in our uh, analysis, uh, we were also looking at strategies. How can you make that happen in the practice? And one of the inspiring uh, approaches uh, for me is still the uh, approach by community-oriented primary care, where you integrate clinical care to individuals and families with a kind of public health approach in order uh, to address also the upstream causes of ill health, Ill health and the social determinants. However, I see that uh, although this strategy exists in the 40s of the previous century and has been developed, first of all, in South Africa, interesting thing, by the way, that there is still a, 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 an, an important gap between uh, primary care as a clinical activity and the looking at uh, public uh, population health and uh, including population strategies in your daily primary care approach. And, uh, we certainly miss appropriate data because I'm convinced that clinical data <clears throat> are of utmost importance also to make a kind of uh, community <laughs> diagnosis. So do you have any strategic suggestion how we can bring public health and primary care closer the ones to the other? And of course, there have been some successful activities during the COVID pandemic where we work together with public health and primary care, but nevertheless, my feeling is that the water is still uh, rather deep between both sectors. So your strategic advice, I think is, it would be important to help us to, to bring those two approaches together because I think they need, the ones need the others so much. 
I have another discussion, uh, question on proportionate universalism, but we will come later on to that. Okay, so to navigate the deep water, uh, have a reliable dinghy uh, that won't sink. Um, we've been doing a couple of different things uh, to try and navigate the gap between primary care and public health. Um, the first is, as you will know well, there's a movement for social prescribing. And uh, it's good to see you, by the way. Um, I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, uh, we've been uh, encouraging the social prescribing. And I was saying to somebody the other day when I was asked about it, I see it uh, that every journey has a first step and social prescribing is an important step. It's not the journey. It's not the destination, but it's um, getting primary care personnel, doctors, nurses, others, uh, is saying we recognize that housing, nutrition, uh, employment, community issues are vital and we'll do what we can to address them. So important, not the answer, but an important step. The second thing we've been doing is working with um, what's now in Britain called integrated care systems. Um, as it's a problem for all countries, I guess, but it's become a British disease um, where you see a problem with healthcare, you just reorganize the healthcare system and you don't solve the problem, you just reorganize it. And so the, um, the, 20, the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, which was supposed to essentially destroy the NHS um, and fragment it and make cooperation much more difficult and bring in private providers and so on, um, that's more or less been rolled back. Uh, and we've now got integrated care systems. Well, we're, we've been working with them. Um, so in Cheshire and Merseyside, where Liverpool is, um, the integrated care system was our client for the work we did with them of trying to embed social determinants of health in what they do. Um, the East London Foundation Trust, which delivers community services, um, to a whole area of East London, declared itself the first Marmot Trust. And um, we, what's interesting, they produced a model that we produced for business. So we were trying to get business on the good side, not the bad side, instead of business being in the, the business of ruining people's health. How about we try and get industry to be a force for good? And we said, there are three domains. We produced a report called the Business of Health Equity, the Marmot Review for Industry. And we said three domains. First, be a good employer, pay people a living wage, good conditions for work. Second, your goods and services and investments should be good for health, not bad for health. So if you're the tobacco industry, forget it. We can't work with you. Um, if you're selling people sugar sweetened beverages, uh, you're on the bad side. Um, but, uh, but other businesses, we can work with you. Think about goods and services. And thirdly, look at the impact on the community, the environment, what in the healthcare system has become known as anchor institutions. And so a public health doctor working in the East London Foundation Trust said, we can take this approach to our healthcare system. Be a good employer, provide good services for the people we serve and be an anchor institution, have a good impact on the community and the environment. So we're taking steps to try and get social determinants of health embedded in the practice of medicine in the community. And it's encouraging the fact that we're being invited in 
from all around Britain, and we'd like to do it more broadly. Yeah, thank you very much, and good afternoon um, to Michael Arnold also. Um, I'm a public health physician, and I've worked in uh, Africa and in Britain, and what I would like to ask is, what kind of strategic approach can be used to actually raise the profile of primary health care um, or primary care, I should say, um, in, in low and middle income countries? Because I see the problem as being that many of the medical um, personnel who are in ministries of health are usually public health trained, but they may do private primary care practice. Um, and that they tend to take on or, or they work in programs which are pretty much dictated by the donors and by the international, um, the big international agencies. So they're done as vertical programs and the whole issue about primary care and public health needs to operate on a horizontal basis. Um, but if you don't have well-resourced situations in at the forefront, uh, then, then primary care is seen as having very low status. It tends to be run by nurses, the people who work there, the least trained. Um, and so it's very difficult to be the center of the health debate. So um, that's my question. How do we do this? Because I think it's essential with climate change, for example, if we don't get our act together in the next few years, we're all going to be facing a disaster. But it, it needs this partnership, but I don't see it happening so long as primary care has such a low status. Thanks. Well, I'm not sure I know how to get from here to there, you know, how to take the political steps to change hearts and minds. Um, but I, I think we all, and certainly I do, understand intellectually why it's vital to do it. Um, and um, I think there's been some shift from donor uh, countries to uh, some shift um, to funding vertical, from funding vertical programs to recognizing the importance of horizontal programs or diagonal, whatever you want to call it, but including healthcare and health services, which has to be based on primary health care. Um, I mean, it can't be the model of you either um, suffer from no health care or you go into a tertiary institution, uh, which seems to be the model that's pushed in some countries. And that can't be right. Uh, so even in, well, I was about to say a rich country like Britain, uh, one of the problems is we're actually a poor country with some rich people. Um, I used to think we are a rich country, but when you look at the numbers, we're actually a poor country with some rich people. Uh, we're a highly unequal country. But even in a country like Britain, um, I, I mean, what's interesting in Britain healthcare system is general practice underwent, I would say, a revolution um, some decades ago, where it went from being the poor relation to being highly respected as being the bedrock of our healthcare system. And in fact, you know, when I used to spend more time teaching undergraduates, we'd get a new group of students and I'd ask them uh, what, you know, what they were interested in. And more than half in a elite institution like University College London, where I'm professor, um, more than half their first choice was primary care. Whereas in the past, it was, well, I'd want to be an obstetrician or a surgeon, but if I can't do that, I'll do general practice. But it was a real change. Um, and that's, that's brilliant. And the Royal College of General Practitioners played an important role. In recent years, that's been under threat. Um, it, and it's partly a systematic undermining of the healthcare system and primary care 
attacks from politicians, it's been undermined. And it's a very negative, very negative step. And it's vital to the healthcare system. And um, even the politicians are starting to recognize that treating people in the community is a better option than having them pour into the hospitals. Uh, now, if we can get that rediscovery of the importance of primary care and treating people in the community, um, I would hope that that would have an impact on the donor agencies, um, the way they approach problems in low and middle income countries would change. Um, and uh, and the, the status of primary care would, I hope, be enhanced. I mean, there's no question that at the moment, um, the neurosurgeons are the first ones asked into dinner, and then uh, maybe the cardiac surgeons next, and primary care and public health make up the end of the queue uh, if we get invited to dinner at all. Um, well, that, that really does need to change. And we need to go back to uh, recognizing that primary care is the bedrock, is the fundamental building uh, block of um, a well-designed healthcare system. So that doesn't answer your question of how we move from there, here to there. Um, but we all need to work on changing hearts and minds of the politicians, of the planners, um, of, uh, I mean, I can see a change. What I do, public health, social determinants of health, um, it was beyond the pale when I started doing it. It was completely unacceptable. Now I have the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, they beat a path to my door. They really want to work with us, the obstetricians and gynecologists. Um, the, the medical specialties are actually saying, we need, to, we need what you do. We need to pay attention to these issues. Well, I would say social determinants of health primary health care are the future of delivering better health for the population. And the fact that we're getting the medical royal colleges in Britain and other medical establishments coming round to that viewpoint, uh, I think is a very positive move. Yeah, thank you a lot for this response. Um, I'm showing you the next question, which was pre prepared previously. And it's also starting with Alma Ata. So as you said before, I was also reading or rereading in the last days the Alma Ata declaration. And it said in 1978 that it's about essential healthcare and first level of contact. But also, as you said, for example, it's integral of the overall social and economic development of the community. And in some Lancet publication, you were also saying that um, healthcare is just one determinant of population health. Other inputs should not be forgotten. And my question, because this is sometimes a con concern, I think, is should primary healthcare and universal health coverage really focus on social determinants and social justice? Or is it too political, too systemic, too far away from local primary healthcare service. And if it should focus on it, what would be your main argument why, and especially also how? So maybe you have some example in mind. Firstly, what I probably should have said before, when, um, when the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health got going, President Lagos of Chile, when his term of office as president finished, he became a member of the commission. And he described to us when he was president of Chile that he wanted to reform the healthcare system and the doctors were threatening to go on strike. Um, and he said, well, that's okay 
as long as you strike in the afternoon as well as the morning. If you know what that means, they were all doing private practice in the afternoon. They're working for the government healthcare system in the morning. Well, you know, he was a very wise political operator. Um, in other words, he's saying, you should be in this not just for your private gain. Um, you should be in this to serve the health of the population. And the question about it is a focus on social justice and social determinants too political. Well, um, firstly, I'd say if you're involved in primary health care, how can you ignore the social determinants of health? Many years ago, in fact, when I was president of the World Medical Association and the Canadians um, said, look, this is terrific. Uh, you're trying to get medical associations uh, dealing with social determinants of health. Let's have a meeting. Um, just um, anybody can come who wants until it's full. We should do it in London at BMA House. And we, uh, so 200 people from 20 countries um, came to the meeting about how medical associations and medical practitioners could focus on social determinants of health. So we had a, it was a two day meeting, brilliant uh, meeting the first day. We had a nice dinner in the BMA house. And that evening after dinner, I was walking um, up the street where BMA is towards Euston Station to catch the underground train home. And as I, I walked past the portico of a church on the corner of Euston Road, there were people bedding down for the night on the concrete platform under the awning of the church. And my first thought, was really stupid. It's only 9.15 in the evening. What are they doing going to bed so early? You know, I guess I was thinking, I'll get home maybe 10 o'clock, and then I'll say hello to my wife and uh, do something, I'll read, do some work, I'll play, whatever you do, uh, for however you spend your evenings. And then I thought, if you're homeless, uh, what else do you have to do after nine o'clock at night but get into your sleeping bag and lie down on the concrete? And so when I went back the next morning to open our meeting for the second day of the meeting and said, I told this little story and said, those people going down, bedding down for the night, outdoors in the cold, on the concrete, slab under the church. Is that any part of our concern? Should we be concerned about that? Are you going to treat the pneumonia or the leg ulcers or the drug problems or the alcohol problems and then send people back to rough sleeping? Is that good practice of medicine? And you might say, well, I'm an individual practitioner. What can I do about rough sleeping? Ah, how about working in partnership with people who can do things about rough sleeping, but don't send them back to the street? Um, I mean, that quite apart from the immorality of sending people back to the street, it's not good practice of medicine. Uh, it makes no sense. So we have to deal with the social determinants of health. And you may remember the report that we did for the World Medical Association. What I said was five areas that medical associations could get involved in social determinants of health. Education and training, so understanding the problem. Second, like dealing with rough sleepers, seeing the patient in broader perspective. Third, the healthcare system as employer, but now I would 
generalize it and say as anchor institution. So not just are you a good employer, but do you have a positive impact on the community and the environment? Fourth, working in partnership. So if you're dealing with a rough sleeper, um, I, partnership with organizations that are providing accommodation uh, with the local government, with the voluntary and community sector, with business, um, whether you're dealing, uh, pediatricians understand this, geriatricians understand this, um, that multiple services are needed. And the fifth is advocacy. Now, is this too political? I, in Britain, um, in recent years, uh, as you can imagine, some politicians get rather interested in what I'm doing. Um, in fact, I've talked to the Scottish Parliament. I've talked to the Liberal Democrat Party, to the Labour Party, to the Welsh Government, to the Northern Ireland Government. The only politicians that don't want to talk to me are the ones currently in government in Westminster. Um, there could be a good reason for that. Um, and uh, talking to one group of politicians, in fact, shadow cabinet, and uh, um, one of the senior politicians said, we're nice people, we've got good ideas, but we're not good at getting our ideas across. What can you tell us? And I smiled and said, certain things come with age and experience and knowing what I'm not good at is one of them. And I'm certainly not good at telling politicians how to communicate, but I can tell you what I do. I tell the truth. I argue from the evidence. And I engage people in a discussion of social justice. The reason we do what we do is one of social justice. It's wrong, unfair, unjust that poorer people should have worse health through no fault of their own. And we in the health care side of things have a responsibility. That's part of what we do. Now, I try probably unsuccessfully not to be party political as I've just described. I've talked to in Britain politicians of any description who want to talk to me. I can't talk to the ones who don't want to talk to me. So I try, at least in public, not to be party political. I mean, just yesterday, I got two invitations to be interviewed. One was from the Scottish Parliament, the, have the parliamentary, and the second was from the British Labour Party. Well, OK, they're, they don't agree with each other. Um, but they're both interested in what I do. Um, if the Conservative government wanted to talk to me, I'd be very happy to talk to them. So I try not to be party political, but there's no question that what I'm proposing, of course, requires political action. Uh, no question. But I don't think social justice should be a political question. It's what motivates all of us who are concerned about health inequities. We had the question, how would you interpret this picture from the perspective of universal health coverage or primary health care? Because we used it a bit to debate it and to talk about the different terms and terminology, of course, as well. Thanks. Um... I put in a little chat and thank you, um, Sir Marmot, about the, um, with the observations, I guess, in the chat and then the, from the picture, um, I look at those different boxes and I'm wondering who's moving the boxes? How do the boxes get moved? I think that's part of the critical thing that image brought forth to me. And, um, and then the issue of the short person can't necessarily move the box and the tall person is on top of a huge stack of boxes and they probably are afraid that everything will come crashing down. So um, 
the importance of partnerships and helping each other, which uh, Sir Michael, I think you really um, emphasized and ex exemplify the idea of really listening carefully to people and, um, and really the first principle of building from success of what I heard you listening for is what's working. What, what are those things that the people are doing for themselves that indicate where they not only have a need, but they have marshaled resources. Um, they obviously can't do it all themselves, but how do we listen from whatever sector we come from and then really meet them where they are? Um, I think is a theme that I've seen over the last half century. So thank you very much. Well, just to comment that, that let me, in relation to what you just said, thank you. Um, when I said I was willing to talk to politicians of different stripes, colors, descriptions, what I should have then added, but let me add it now, um, given the lack of, in Britain, the lack of interest from the central government over the last dozen years, in fact, worse than lack of interest, they've taken steps to increase child poverty, they've reduced the funding for local government in a regressive fashion, uh, they've taken a number of steps that have headed off in what I would call the wrong direction. Uh, after my 2010 Marmot Review for England, the English city of Coventry declared itself a Marmot city. They took my six domains of recommendations and said, we're going to make this the basis for our planning at the city level. Then Greater Manchester took it on. We did a report, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester. Um, and we very much worked with all the key sectors. We were invited in by the mayor, the elected mayor of Greater Manchester, but um, we worked with community groups, with the voluntary and community sector, with city government, with the health and care partnership. We got education, the police, the fire and rescue service. After we did our report, they convened a, a Marmot implementation group. And all the key sectors of Manchester, including um, very important representation from community groups. So it was really inspiring. Now, does it work? Well, they have put in place a monitoring system. So we've got 24 Marmot Beacon indicators for Greater Manchester, and we're putting in place monitoring systems in all the cities and regions we've worked in around the UK. Uh, and we will be able to answer the question, or at least provide a partial, partial answer to the question of what works. Um, but it is involving, uh, I mean, I, it was a lesson I learned early, um, work we did in Liverpool, come in as an outside expert, and rightly, they are suspicious of you. Engage the community, and then you develop a partnership. Thank you a lot. Um, Jan has another question, and I think this might be our last one, because, of course, we want to respect your time as well. Please, Jan. Uh, thanks for all this uh, information. Um, when I look at the picture that we saw together, of course, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the, f the one where you have to remove the fence and when what is called the justice. And I think that that, of course, is, is a very important one. Of course, we can create solidarity and that is helpful in order to replace the boxes. But the final solution is, of course, to remove the fence so that people have access and can yeah, live the lives that they want to live uh, in good health. And uh, the point is, of course, that nowadays uh, uh, we have the quintuple aim. And I'm very happy that the fifth aim of the quintuple aim is uh, social justice and inclusion. And I think that, of course, defines also the medical profession and the healthcare profession as a political enterprise because social justice and inclusion is about yeah, political choices. And I think that that is 
uh, a very important uh, point. The other thing is, of course, that I see uh, more and more new fences being built uh, also in our health system. Uh, we re recognize in all countries nowadays that there's something like an inequity by disease uh, in my country, Belgium, and in many other countries, by the way, when you have hemiplegia due to stroke, you will have access to a different package of care than maybe when you have the same condition, hemiplegia, due to a brain tumor, because we have a cancer plan. And uh, so there are a lot of advantages in terms of uh, access uh, and also affordability uh, for people that have the diagnosis cancer when you compare to other diagnoses. And I think this is a kind of inequity that we create ourselves uh, from the health system perspective. And we should be very careful about that. I see the same in developing countries uh, when I see that people with HIV AIDS, they have access to a lot of care uh, elements and also to, for instance, for the children to all kinds of social uh, grants, uh, which is okay in itself, but which of course, uh, usually unfair when you compare to its people with other conditions like diabetes, where in a lot of African countries, there's even no access to elementary basic medication for diabetes. And of course, also vertical donors play a role in that uh, point. But I, so I think we, we have to be very critical also about the way we organize our own system in order that we as a healthcare system become not a kind of uh, determinant that leads to more inequity in health and in healthcare. Well, perhaps, you know, building on what Jan just said um, and coming back to my earlier answer about social justice, the healthcare system expresses our values as a society. I mean, is it not remarkable that in his recent State of the Union address, President Biden referred to the cost of insulin? My heavens, my heavens. When was insulin discovered? A hundred years ago? How many different corporations are there that produce insulin, and half the polity in the United States thinks that limiting the price of insulin is somehow communism, or God knows what they think it is, um, but shouldn't be done, and that the president feels that he has to announce in his State of the Union address that he's trying to limit the cost of insulin. You mean in the United States of America, diabetics can't afford their insulin. If ever you wanted a demonstration that the healthcare system reflects, embodies, enshrines the value of a society, there it is. Diabetic, you pay for your insulin or you die. What? What? This is beyond ghastly. Now, you know, there were so many other things to talk about with his State of the Union address that um, who focused on the fact that he mentioned the price of insulin. Good heavens. So whether you're in a low income country, a middle income country, a high income country, our healthcare system reflects our values as a society. And more generally, I would say that what I've been pushing all these years in social determinants of health reflects our values as a society. Do we care as a society that people have poor health simply because they're of low income? Do we care? Well, I think we should. I don't often use the word should, um, but I think we should. And I think this comes back to my fifth one about advocacy. Those of us in the healthcare system are the ones who really do care. And we have to bring that care to the attention of everyone in our society. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, not just for this response, but for this whole hour with you. I would like to say really, really thank you. It was really kind of you to accept our invitation. My pleasure. Thank you.